So um, um, we're now recording and um, again, I just wanna thank all of you for joining today and uh, for listening to me uh, share a little bit about the council and SBI. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our sister, Carrie. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Carrie Herthel. I'm Ethlyn Rumson of Monterey County, California. And I just want to start before I start talking to let you know that I live way out in Ventana Wilderness and sometimes my connection can uh, inter be interrupted. So if that happens, um, it's an accident. I'm doing my very, very best to make sure that this connection is strong today. As a survivor of sex tra trafficking, I'm also a descendant of California's, um, I'm also a descendant of the California genocide of California's first people. And I want to bring healing to the shame as my story intersects with the history of intergenerational trauma. You can see right now that um, I'm starting off with uh, reading and I wrote down notes here um, so, because this is a challenge to come on to this webinar and be with you and speak from the heart. And it matters so much uh, for me for these very reasons that I just shared with you. And I want to do a good job. As a survivor, um, it's been 27 years that um, my sex trafficker intercepted my life, but it didn't begin just then. I was born as Judy Ann Garcia, and my birth father was my first trafficker. My father was a pimp and my mother was a prostitute, and they sold their children into adoption so that they could continue in the life. This is why it is a challenge for me to stand up and reclaim my voice. It's not a, it's, it's not a gentle story. My story is very, very tragic and it carries a lot of complex trauma. But this healing of reclaiming my voice um, in the last 27 years to not use alcohol and drugs or other substances to numb myself and stay detached from my history is an important process for my healing. Standing with my voice and speaking about my wounds from sex trafficking and the past has been very difficult. But standing today with my survivor sisters to educate, inform, to seek social justice from oppression is my path. And it's helping me to make sense of such harm. Mm -hmm. Moving away from what I wrote and moving down to my heart even though it sounds, and I'm telling you the truth, that standing up with my voice has been very, very challenging. At times, I'm triggered. Um, the memories start coming up. I do a lot of public speaking, um, but it still happens. But that does not detour my resilience to stand up and make a difference and change what's happening to our children and to our communities. 
And so that, that poison, that history has become a gift. And oftentimes it overrides my complex trauma. It's what I, what I ground into and um, being with my sisters today, being with the Sovereign <coughs> Body Institute is such a gift for me um, for these reasons. When I first started coming out and sharing my story, I, I was not accepted by my family for speaking up, my birth family. Um, you know, I didn't grow up with my culture. I didn't grow up with my family. And they were like, who is this? Who is this that, that's come back to talk about her father and talk about these secrets? Um, however, doing this work, even with that cha challenge, has changed me in ways um, that I know that the ancestors walk with me. I know that in this challenge of doing my best to communicate with you, this is what matters for me. And I want to know if there's someone that's listening, listening, that it's happening within your home, within your family, or within your history, that we understand and we are here for you. I don't know how much time I've spoken, but I think that I've done my very best today. This is what I've brought forward today to tell you a little bit about myself. And I want to pass it now to my sister Sutton. Thank you for hearing me Carrie. and lifting me up today. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, sister. Hoso Shakoli Sutton King Naktau Pianuki Nuyuk Yats in Wahawai Mi'i Wakneta Nawagi Talota Oniata Oga Mi'i. My English name is Sutton King <clears throat> and my Indian name is Naktau Pianuki. And that means comes first woman in Menominee. Um, in Oneida, I told you my name, that I'm Oneida, that I'm Turtle Clan, and that I'm the people of the Standing Stone. I am Afro-Indigenous from the Oneida and Menominee Nations of Wisconsin, and I currently live in New York City, and I've been here for almost a decade, which is surreal to say. I have a BA in Psychology and a minor in Sociology from the College of Mount St. Vincent. I have a Master's of Public Health with a concentration of Global Health from New York University School of Global Health, graduating cum laude. I'm the executive director and founder of the Urban Indigenous Collective, a 501c3 nonprofit focused on the health and wellness of urban natives living in the tri-state area. I'm the co-founder of Shock Talk, a telebehavioral app that connects native users to native and indigenous therapists. I serve as a researcher and a consultant for University of New Mexico, Florida State University, and the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues supporting unprecedented research and project, uh, projects focused on Native and Indigenous health, uh, both, dom both domestically and internationally. Earlier in my career, I led the development and implementation of the first culturally tailored simulation that trained law enforcement how to engage with tribal youth without re-traumatizing them, while also implementing suicide prevention programming throughout Indian country. I was formerly the director of an urban Indian health program here in New York City, and that time there inspired my social entrepreneurship to create uh, community and indigenous led public health solutions. And most importantly, I am a survivor. And I share my accomplishments first. Because my entire life, I have struggled with, um, excuse me, imposter syndrome. 
is not for me. <laughs> every classroom I sat in, every student organization I led, every accomplishment I've achieved, I fought with this internal distrust, distrust that I was a fraud, that my trauma would never allow me to be good enough. So I share my accomplishments first because I am good enough and I am proud of the trials and tribulations I've conquered to achieve the heights that I have today. Today, I'm going to share parts of my story for the first time so that any survivor who's listening right now who, do, who doesn't believe that they can earn a degree, start a business while walking in their truth all at the same time, I'm here to tell you, I have two, degree, two, two degrees, I've started two businesses, and I'm no longer afraid to share my truth or walk in it. My survivor story starts before my sex trafficking experiences. Like many of my sisters here, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, incest, rape, stalking, and domestic violence. And I come from, that I know of, <clears throat> three generations of this complex trauma. Growing up, I was molested by four relatives starting at the age of three or four. I can't really remember until the age of about 12. During that period, I was also molested by a boyfriend of a babysitter. I was raped three times in my life, once at the age of 14 and twice at the age of 15, not counting uh, my trafficking experiences. At the age of 18, I confronted one of my relatives who abused me as a child. This relative abused me more significantly and more frequently than any other of my abusers. And I was told by women, plural, in my family, different variations of, it happened to me and we just don't talk about it. Well, this is me talking about it. I was 19 years old in my junior year of undergrad when I met my trafficker online through the guise of a photo shoot. The irony is that I was pursuing a psychology, psychology degree while I was being groomed and manipulated. And I really say this to say that sex trafficking can sex trafficking can happen to anyone. He made me believe that I was his girlfriend and after sharing financial difficulties and my personal traumas that I've shared with you all today, two months later I was exploited in multiple cities. After trying to escape my trafficker through a window of a hotel and being forced back, and attempting suicide on the same night. The next day I was taken from him in a sting operation. For many years, I remained silent about my experience because I was manipulated to believe that it was all my idea, <laughs> all of my plan, that I wanted to be exploited, to be trafficked. I felt like I deserved what happened to me and believing I deserved that type of abuse and trauma my next partner physically abused me for six months. I was stalked by both individuals for years, having to block fake Instagrams, newly made emails, iMessages, you name it, I had to block it. Constantly being re-triggered over the years. It took me five years to realize I was a survivor of trafficking and that I didn't deserve what happened to me. <clears throat> I found the strength to begin using my voice after friending Anita on Facebook. And for a long time, my mom, who's out there listening right now, Kate Tapani kiss kind of would talk. I love you, cloud, low cloud woman. She was the only person who knew what happened to me. She was the only person who supported me, loved me unconditionally, no matter what traumas I went through. So many of those traumas she went through too. She heard Anita speak and encouraged me to friend her on Facebook. She's always sending me just, you know, badass Native women to follow, because she is one. Her, her standing in her truth, Anita, standing in her truth really encouraged me to, to um, friend her, send her a message, and uh, come forward and share my experiences with her. You know, at first our connection was 
just research based by a, a dear friend, Ariel, um, and colleague. And um, now, years later, I've done the work to begin sharing my story. I struggle with intimacy and romantic relationships because, again, for a long time, I didn't think I deserved love. But I was someone who uh, couldn't be loved and I couldn't give love in return. But I know that's not true because when I love, I love hard. And I know all of my friends and family who are here supporting me today know I love. After being silenced for most of my life, I'm finally using my voice. Loudly and proudly and with some tears, but you know, one day I'm be able to tell my story without those. <laughs> I'm telling uh, my story in many, many ways. Um, you know, right now on the Survivors Leadership Council, on my social media platforms, and I'm also working with an attorney to take on large hotel corporations to hold them accountable for being complicit in trafficking. I share my story because I want every survivor to know that they can reclaim their voice and that you can occupy any space that you want as a survivor. You are good enough, you are strong, you are resilient, and you are not your trauma. I want to remind you that your truth is good medicine and you don't have to feel shame for what happened to you and we are here to help you to heal. Wawain and Yako, to my sisters here on the council and to my friends and family out there supporting me. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my sister Chelsea. Thank you all. Thank you, Shatni. Uh, thank you, Katsiaya. Dos Nananana, Na Hase Hise, Na Anagach. Hanane Nina, Na Chupe. Hi, everybody. Hi, my relatives. My name is Chelsea Hendrickson. I am an enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho tribe uh, from the Wind River Indian Reservation in Ithati, Wyoming. I'm also Jupik uh, from Lunavac Island, Alaska, and a Chalista Corporation shareholder. Um, I work full time as a program assistant uh, for the Cowlitz Indian Tribe within the Pathways to Healing program in Tuckwilla, Washington. I also have a second job as a youth advocate uh, with the Labatia Youth Home um, in Seattle, Washington. I currently work and live in Tuckwilla, Washington. And also recently, I've decided to uh, come out as a survivor of trafficking and um, collaborate with the Survivors Leadership Council within the Sovereign, Sovereign Bodies Institute. Um, like many of these ladies, many like many of these strong Native women um, on this council, this is one of the first times that I've come out about my experience of trafficking. Um, it, it, it definitely isn't a unique one. I'm trying to set a timer here. I forgot I was supposed to set a timer. We got 10, we got 10 minutes, which ain't a lot. So I'm going to give you guys a little gist of who I am and my experience. And this definitely won't, uh, won't be the last time that you're going to hear from us. This is going to be the last time that you hear our stories, that you see us cry, that you see us in a, a, a position that's maybe vulnerable or, you know, talking about these super hard things that a lot of us do have experience talking about, right? Domestic violence, sexual assault trafficking, elder abuse, you know, things that are going on in Indian country as we speak, right? And uh, just the, head, the handful of ladies that are in this council, the eight, nine, ten of us, all happen to be the ones that are able to escape that, right? Survive that, escape those experiences. We know many relatives, cousins, people, young Native women that are out there right now experiencing and being groomed by, uh, having those same experiences and being groomed by those same type of people that we that we hate, right? Um, but the reality of the situation is that these people live in our communities. They work in the types of field that we work in, right? I know a lot of predators that are doing social work that are in the urban native community in and around Seattle right now. Um, so a lot of these things I want to highlight, just like Sutton highlighted, is that you are not alone. Our experiences are you are not unique in that you don't have to live with that shame, anxiety, that grief, that pain no more. You, uh, I'm very thankful to Anita Lucchese and the Sovereign Bodies Institute for giving us a platform to speak our truth and live our truth and uh, come out as survivors, survivors of that shame, survivors of that pain, survivors of that guilt and those stereotypes with um, uh, being a Native woman who has survived trafficking. Um, with that being said, I'll just give you guys a quick, uh, a little bit of my story. Um, 
I was 18 years old when I graduated from James A. Garfield High School here in Seattle, Gold Bulldogs. Um, two days after that, I jumped on a Greyhound back to the reservation in Wyoming because I missed my res so much. I missed my community. I missed my Arapaho people. I was like, I need a break from high school, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the res. Um, I got to the res, and unfortunately, I was raped by a good friend's stepdad. This is the first time I've ever been raped. Um, I was called a homewrecker, a hoe, a, uh, you know, all the words that you could call a young 18-year-old girl who didn't know any better, I believed it, right? So now I'm in a position of being 18 years old, having low self-esteem and believing all these things that are being said about me and believing that I deserved rape, believing that it, it was my fault, that these things happened because I was drinking or because I was wearing something or because I asked for it. But the reality of the situation I know at 31 years old, looking back at that time in my life, is that I was preyed upon. Young Native women are being preyed upon day in and day out uh, from the day that we leave our, our, our mother's womb, right? This, and this ain't a new story. This is going back to, to contact since Columbus, right? That Native, uh, I, I hear, and I hate that word vulnerable. I hear lots of people use the word uh, our vulnerable populations, vulnerable, you know, I don't, I don't like that word because the, the reality of the situation is we're preyed upon. We are, there's predators out there who are preying upon us. And with that being said, I was raped. You know, I'm, I'm um, now um, 18 years old, uh, going through depression and believing that I deserve, you know, I asked to be raped. And so I get a fake ID. I'm getting into, I'm going to the border town on my reservation and starting to get into bars and stuff like that. So I could drink myself till I'm blackout drunk because I don't know how to deal with what's going on in my life as a young native woman. And um, so it was just some native woman's ID, state ID that I found. I would go to the bouncers. Um, they would, some of them would look at it and be like, okay, we know you clearly this ain't you. So they would let me go. They would, they'd tell me no. And then eventually there was this one bouncer who's a white guy about 33 years old from Vegas who purposely traveled to the border town of my reservation because he heard that there was loopholes in the laws, that it's easy to find young native girls and put them on backpage.com and label them as Native American because it's a hot ticket to sell and label us as exotic because it's a very, it's easy to sell these types of girls. So he traveled all the way from this pimp who groomed me, traveled all the way from Vegas to the border town of my reservation to purposely find a girl like me, a young 18 year old girl who's drinking herself to death, you know, to blackout stage at the bar. Um, so I, one day I come across this man, a white man, about 33. He sees my fake ID, gives me a smile and lets me in. And um, from there we create a relationship. He pretends to be my boyfriend. He groomed another uh, 18 year old girl. Um, within two months, you know, I, you know, we're in some sort of relationship. He's pretending to be my boyfriend. Um, he start ha starts grooming me for the idea of making money. And then one night I get drunk and I wake up and I'm in the backseat of his car and we're on the road and I ask him where we're going. And he told me we're going to Billings to make money. Um, with that being said, like I said, at 31 years old, I'm able to, and being that I've been in the DVSA field doing this type of work in my community here in the Seattle uh, area for the past three years, I could look back at this time in my life and be like, yo, <laughs> this was not my fault. I did not ask for this. I was literally groomed, manipulated. But for 12 years, I've been holding on to the shame, this guilt that this was my fault. I had a choice. I knew my mama and my grandmama raised me to know right from wrong. But the reality the situation is the more I learn and the more I realize that it's crazy how the, what type of sick world we live in, right? The type of sick, twisted, patriarchal Trump era type world that we live in where young native women are preyed upon for trafficking. So at 31, I could look back and, re and, not, and not hold on to that shame. 12 years of believing that I had a choice and this was my fault and that I need to be ashamed and so, so ashamed of this that I cannot tell a soul. Well, you ever heard, I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm done with that. I'm letting this be free on top of all the other stuff that I'm hearing from, all that historical intergenerational trauma that us as Native people that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, this is just another thing I'm letting go. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to put the work in, the time and the energy to heal from this. I'm going to use the medicine that not only that comes within me from my ancestors, from my mama and my grandma, but I'm going to use that medicine from my community and from the sisters and on this council. And I'm going to work to not only heal myself, but to heal our communities and start, and start that conversation in the context of being game changers 
when we're talking about human trafficking in Indian country. So I'm, I'm making that conscious choice to heal from it. It's as, to start this conversation because if I don't, then that's gonna be my niece, my daughter, my little cousins have started starting that. And I refuse to let, I have an eight year old niece, a nine year old niece, she's about to be nine. Her name's Lily. She's the light of my life. And I refuse to let her experience this or for her to uh, have to start that conversation being just like set and touched on that, that multi-generational um, of abuse. But anyways, I'll keep it pushing here. I don't got much time. I don't know who's, who's timing me. I'm, I'm losing time. So I got two minutes. So um, uh, so I woke up in the back seat of this uh, pimp's car. I didn't, I didn't know at this time that this was a pimp, right? I thought this was my boyfriend. This, like this 33-year-old man is pretending to be my 18-year-old self's boy, uh, boyfriend, right? Because I'm beautiful and all these things. So I wake up and he tells me we're headed towards Billings to make some money. Um, this is around June now. This is about three months after I've been raped. And it's beginning of summer, and I had turned 19 at this point. So at, at, some, at this point, I turned 19, and we get to Billings, and we go to a library. He brings me in the library with him, and I'm like, what are we doing? And he lets me know that we're going to create a Backpage account. And we get out to Backpage.com, we go somewhere, he takes pictures of me, and for the next three months after that, I was uh, sold on Backpage.com for sex, and I was trafficked between Billings, Montana, and Spokane, Washington. And at some point, I would... I didn't have a phone, but I would call home and people, people back home on the res be like, where are you? Where are you? Your mom's freaking out. She's about to file a missing persons report. No one knows where you are. And, um, you know, I, people just thought I was out partying and all these things that people think, right? And maybe I think maybe at one point I called my mom and she would freak out on me and I'd be like, hey, I'm safe. It's all good. Don't worry. And eventually at the end of the three months, my trafficker let me know that he had a girlfriend that was pregnant in Vegas and that she was about to calf out or give birth and um, that we, he needed to take me home. And um, because at, some, at points between that, like I would get drunk and like hate myself and I would, I would come to maybe I would sober up and I'd be like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. This isn't right. I want to go home. And then my trafficker would let me know that's not happening. You're staying here. I'll get roughed up, whatever. But during those three months, I was trying to leave. I was trying to go home, but it didn't work out that way. I'm very thankful that his girlfriend was about to give birth. So he let us know, it's time to pack up. It's time to go. He took me to back to my reservation. He dropped me off in front of my Indian casino. I never saw him again. After that experience, I realized I did not want to be trafficked. I did not want to sell myself for sex. So I proceeded to look for a job. And I never thought about that situation again. People knew, people were like, what happened to her? You know, I continued to live my life as normal. But like I said, the more I think about the story, now that after 12 years, I'm letting this story come back to me. I'm starting to heal. I'm starting to process the trauma. I'm reaching out to therapists. I'm taking the steps that it takes to start this process of healing. The more I get tripped out, the more I'm thinking, like, oh my God, it's, it's crazy to think about all these things that happen because... You know, even though I haven't lived back on my reservation for six years, I think about, I think back on all the situations I was in. I remember conversations with my trafficker being like, oh, after we leave Billings, we're going to try to go up to North Dakota because they got man camps up there and you guys would sell really good up there. I always think like, oh my God, what if I was taken to North Dakota? What if I was being sold in those man camps? Would I be alive right now? I also think like of other girls that are on the reservation, that same thing that happened to me, you know, you hear about these girls disappearing, these 19, these 18, 20 year old girls and everybody, people will be like, what happened to her? Where's she at? Oh, well, we last saw her with that guy. So we probably, people have an idea, people think, people have an idea of the trafficking that's going on, but it's not being called out in our communities. Cause why? We're too busy dealing with COVID. We're too busy trying to eat. We're too busy trying to pay rent. So a lot of the um, things that Native, Indian country is going through, um, they all, they're all very intertwined. They all do go hand in hand. But I, uh, being part of this leadership council gives me so much faith, so much hope and faith that, you know, we're going we're gonna to be out here uh, changing the game, changing the narr narrative, telling our story and taking our power back. And I'm excited to see what comes to fruition of, of this. This is our first webinar, right? What conversation and what type of change um, in our in Indian country happens just based off of, uh, of this council? So I want to raise my hand, say ha ho, goyana to all you brave ladies, uh, the a Sovereign Bodies Institute and uh, the people that tuned in today. Um, uh, wish everybody um, nothing but 
uh, good health and wealth and to stay safe during this COVID and to uh, continue to empower and uplift survivor voices. So I'll leave you guys with that today. Haho, Goyana. Peace. I can't remember who I'm supposed to introduce next, but one of my sisters go next. It's me. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chelsea. And thank you for everybody who has actually gone um, ahead of me. I echo everything that you've said as far as taking voices back and standing in our power. Um, my name is Rachel Ibarra Smith. I am Chicana, Chiricahua Apache, and the Hana Otham. I am uh, broadcasting live from Nisan on Miwok land in Sacramento and we're melting out here. It's over a hundred degrees. Um, and so, and thank you, Anita, for all of this. Um, I, I was introduced to Anita's work a couple years back. We corresponded over email and, um, you know, years later, who knew what was in store for all of us, right? Thank God for social, uh, social media at this point. So, um, I have two children, I am a single mom, and I am currently a CSEC case manager in Sacramento, California. I support uh, youth who are sex trafficked in the foster care system. I work at a nonprofit uh, law firm, and I love it. It's the best work I've ever done. And how I came into this work, um, it was, it was, it's a bit of a, you know, creator always has a plan. That's what I absolutely believe and understand for myself. So um, I got clean and sober on July 2013, July 2nd, 2013. I'm coming up on seven years if I play my cards right. And from that journey, I decided that I wanted to be a drug and alcohol counselor. And I decided that what was going to set me apart, yo, I didn't set my timer. Um, what was going to set me apart was that I was going to learn the Red Road curriculum because that, that's what I believed in. That's what helped me heal. And, um, you know, I, I got this job with all these hopes that I was going to transition to that department. And I went and got my KDAC and, you know, I just, it, it never came to fruition. I never could get a job in that field. And, um, and now I know why. So my story is very similar to all of the other women that are here. I suffer the same traumas. Um, and like, you know, we've all talked about before, all of this is intersecting. And so mine began, I actually realized what was happening in about 2017. So backing up, I got clean in 2013. I started doing the work and I cut my teeth in advocacy um, around 2014 when I worked at the Native Health Center. And I thought, no, oh, this is something that I could definitely do. Um, I moved on as a victim advocate at a rape crisis center. And uh, that was very near, like very, very good work that I was passionate about. I lost a cousin to domestic violence in 2004. So we are also an MMIW family. Um, for, and, and for us, there was justice. And so that was, that was a blessing. Um, what I've learned uh, through recovery and this process of, of getting to where I am right now is to trust the process and to realize that the effort is mine and the outcome is not. And so my story begins um, with the, my drug use. I used drugs for about 20 years. And when I was working at the rape crisis center after I had been clean for about four years, I had this boss who was doing a survey and she was asking us specific questions so we could get extra gift cards. And I was like, ooh, I want as many gift cards as you know, I could possibly get. And so she had, she had asked me a question and she had said, have you ever traded your body for drugs? And I thought, yeah. So I got an extra gift card. I'm thinking, this is great, this is cool. I got a hundred bucks. In hindsight, that was a pivotal moment in my life. And she was, uh, that was a defining woman. She was the pivotal person because that's where I started to learn about what was really happening. I think what is most important is that for people to understand that it's force, fraud, and coercion or trading something of value. Although my story is definitely similar than all of these other sisters that are on here, I'm lucky to get out. I'm lucky to have 
sobriety under my belt because without that I would have never I would have never gotten out and I never would have known um, you know this is the first time I've spoke out about it publicly I've done the work before as a survivor but I've always been confidential I've always been anonymous and the reason for that is just like Carrie was saying earlier and some of our other family or sisters here is that you know, we don't want to speak out and we don't want to shame our families. That's not what we want to do. That's definitely not our intention. But we also know that without speaking out, there's no way for us to heal and there's no way for us to change. And one of our sisters calls it change makers, that we're change makers, not necessarily surviving. Because I learned that once I was on this path, I was already thriving. I was already doing really good and big things um, for my community, for myself, for my family, and for my children. And so, you know, reclaiming the language, I think, of survivorship, um, although it's, it's beautiful and it's great, many of us get here after we have made our way out and we've done the work. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any service providers on this call, <clears throat> but I think what was incredibly important for many of us here on this council right now is that some of us found our healing through our cultural ways. And some of us found healing from cultural ways that we borrowed from other people, um, such as myself. My people come from Arizona, but I'm here on the East and Miwok land, and I was introduced to a sweat lodge. And <clears throat> I was introduced to that by one of my family members who was actually going through some stuff and needed a lot of support. And you know, all of this therapy and this stuff that I've done, it from, you know, the dominant culture, if you will, focuses on, on the mental part, on the emotional part. They want to do trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. There's all of these fancy chime words that go with it, right? But almost none of them offer, I will say in my experience that I've been working here, none of them offer a spiritual component. They do not touch the four directions. And for me as a native indigenous person, that's exactly what I need to heal. That's exactly what I need to continue to thrive. Um, before I knew what it actually was, I had a spiritual safety plan. And talking to some of my sisters and learning some of their stories, they also did as well. Some of us hit rock bottom and some of us absolutely are desperate. And in times, those times we reach out, we call out, we pray and we ask for some sort of support um, you know, it's no accident that we're all here at the same time with a lot of us having similarities to where this is the first time we're speaking out. Um, divine time is something that I desperately believe in, but I really struggle with because I always want what I want now. <laughs> and that typically doesn't happen for me. Um, I think, too, what's really important is that, you know, well, for family members who are speaking out, and this is their first time, I was terrified to tell my mom. And when I told her, she was really supportive, and she was really, really um, loving and very, very understanding. And she was understanding because she knows that the story is repeated in my family, on my father's side and on my mother's side. And I think that that, for me, was such a heavy weight that was lifted like a burden because I literally didn't know what she would think. I know what I thought and felt about myself. So it was really hard for me to speak out and say anything to anybody else. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're not, we're not alone. And I think that is the medicine of these leadership councils. Um, you know, we, go through all of the same things that people who haven't experienced trafficking goes through. We are definitely strong, resilient people. This is just a part of our story. I don't have any letters behind my name yet, but I have also been um, overlooked in the professional workplace. I have also been shunned. I have also been shamed because, um, you know, I wasn't Indian enough and I certainly wasn't Mexican enough and not knowing my language and all of these other things that are really near and dear but for some of us culture is on a spectrum and we don't have access to all of that all the time 
And so for me, what I do have access to is something that is the most important part of my story because that's what got me out. That's what got me out is that spiritual safety plan. I use it with the kids that I support in foster care today. They think it's weird, but it is a message to the universe that changes things without your permission. And it is something that brings healing and, um, and comfort to you in times of, of desperate need. Um, I don't know how much time I have. 30 seconds. Um, for all of you, thank you for coming. And I will now turn it over to Jessica. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Bonjour. My name is Jessica Smith. My Ojibwe name is Gitaga Kuntz. I am an enrolled member of the Boy Sport Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. Um, I grew up on the Fond du Lac Reservation. Um, we uh, grew up with a very alcoholic stepfather, so we have a lot of domestic abuse that I grew up around. Um, we kind of escaped that when I was like 15, and then I still kind of had those type the traumas um, from that abuse, watching my mother get abused every night. Um, and then that was, around that time when, is when I started using alcohol and drugs. Um, at 16 years old, I was raped. And because I made the, you know, uh, mistake that a lot of young girls do when they are raped, um, first thing I did was take a shower. Um, and so I was unable to to press any charges or get any type of justice for that crime against me. Um, and that was a crime that, because it happened at my boyfriend's house um, by one of his friends that sent me spiraling really into a, a deep, dark depression. And I sought the help of a medicine man because throughout like all the, all of the, therapists and people, doctors that tried to put me on depression medication, none of that worked. Um, so I went and I seen a medicine man who, who taught me some cultural ways. Um, he taught me how to call back my spirit. And for a while, you know, that did help me. Um, I was able to graduate high school I went to uh, Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College where I graduated with the AA and AS in law enforcement. Um, Cause at that time I was still young and um, I knew that somehow, some way I wanted to be able to help victims of crime because I was already victimized at a young age. And so that's why I took the law enforcement program um, the sem the semester that I was um, in the skills program, my dad died, and that really took the uh, ground out from underneath me. Um, it almost killed me. I almost overdosed on all my antidepressant medications, and I was removed from that program because you can't miss any any classes, and I missed one for my dad's funeral. Um, so that time period is kind of a blur, honestly. I don't remember a lot of it. I was, there was a lot of heavy drinking, um, a lot of really toxic, uh, relationships with men who, who never really respected me, never really wanted to know who I was, um, really just seen me as a sex object. And then... I had a daughter um, in 2007, I had a daughter and I still really struggled with depression. I was um, still drinking, not, you know, 
not a very good mom. I will admit that. And um, I had the help of my stepfather, who I did forgive because he was sober. And he um, kind of took the place of a grandfather for for me, um, for my daughter. He supported us financially. And then when my daughter was four years old, he sexually abused her. Um, when that happened, I not only lost a second father, but I lost an entire family because his family completely turned on me. Um, and that was right around the same time that I started um, getting groomed. Uh, I was groomed probably for about six months before I was trafficked. Um, it was, you know, the, the darkest period in my life. Um, I was trafficked out to Las Vegas and I made it home, um, with the help of my mom. Um, but I came home with a lot of inner scars and a lot of, of pain and anger. Um, and I'm still healing from that, but with, sorry. <laughs> so anyways, fast forward to why I'm here today. Um, I decided a couple years ago that I was going to stop letting grief and trauma and abuse keep me debilitated. I needed to be able to rise above that. So I applied. <clears throat> I applied to uh, University of Wisconsin Superior and I was really unsure if I was even going to get in because um, when I was at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, my grades weren't very good. Obviously, I wasn't um, trying very hard. I was uh, very depressed and I was going through a lot of things. So I barely graduated from Fond du Lac. But I feel like I wrote a powerful enough um, admissions essay that I was thankfully uh, accepted to UWS. And since then, my life has completely changed. Um, even before, a couple uh, months before the semester was supposed to start last year, my mom, who has been the biggest support for me since all of this throughout my entire life um, had a life-threatening brain injury and I almost lost my mom right before I was going to start to go back to school. So I had to up, kind of uproot my life to come care for my mom but she thankfully um, survived what should have definitely killed her um she survived that and i i got some more strength out of that situation alone and i started excelling really greatly in school um my first semester back to school i got a 4.0 gpa and made the dean's list um i just did the same thing again this semester i have received multiple scholarships uh, foundation scholarships, multiple awards. I got the um, Emerging Leader Award from Sovereign Bodies, and that's what brought me to the panel is my research. I um, I did independent study, and I'm researching um, MMIW, and I started that because of the things I've gone through, and I just wanted to you know, know more about, especially grassroots organizations and, and the things that, that people have been doing for years that are kind of unnoticed. Um, and I wanted to be able to bring, to help bring uh, awareness to that. So um, right now I'm doing, I am a McNair scholar and I'm doing um, research on trafficking, intimate partner violence, and cultural he healing. Um, and I'm also doing an independent study on grassroots organizations. Um, so with both of that, all of that, I'm really hoping to shine light on 
on the grassroots organizations that have been doing this work um, for for how long and kind of gone unnoticed, especially Anita. I can't be, an, you know, I'm so, so grateful for Anita. Um, as soon as I met one of her first reports, I'm like, hey, I got to be, I got to connect with her. I emailed her, hey, I'm, I'm researching, I'm, you know, um, connected with her and that's just this this um council alone has been it's been more healing i think than anything really just being connected with everybody with the same some of the same similarities same stories of strengths and overcoming strengths and um i had this quote that i think is really important and it's just that i like to to go by because it's, um, now I'm going to lose my thought. Oh, uh, I was abused quietly, so I choose to uh, heal loudly. And I think that's a really important thing for for anybody, um, all survivors. Uh, you know, you don't have to be quiet. It's time to break the silence. It's time to break these cycles and stop the cycle of intergenerational trauma like it ends with us um, and then there's another one that I really found profound it's just it's called acceptance it's by Ash Alves and it just says release the shame and guilt from your past and accept how things have transpired. Your past shortcomings taught you invaluable lessons that you can help you become a better person. Use your pain to create your greatest victory. And that is something that I would like totally get like tattooed on my arm <laughs> because um, just the reminder of of overcoming things that are meant to destroy you um, and being that strength of source for for indigenous women and indigenous children, men, everybody who, who, who's been experiencing this multi-generational and intergenerational trauma. Like we have the power and we need to reclaim our voices. And, and so I'm very, very thankful for this council and for everybody um, that is here with us today. That's it. That's all I'm gonna say. It's my turn. And I think I don't know who I was supposed to introduce next. Um, Hi everyone. Yeah. Hi, Anine. First but foremost, I'd like to acknowledge my spirit name, she who collects medicine for the people and she who works in the heart for the people. I come from the Lynx clan. Um, I, I originate in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Um, I originate from the Treaty 1 territories and the lands of the Treaty 1 uh, peoples uh, from a First Nations community called Sandy Bay Ojibwe First Nation. It's such an honor. First but foremost, I'd like to also acknowledge Anita and lift her up in the work that she's been doing around this and all my survivor sisters um, that are um, a part of the, the line today. Um, so for myself, um, I'm here to share um, some pieces. I am a survivor of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation here in Canada. So um, some of the, uh, I just want to go back to um, how, how it all started. So I became a victim of abuse at seven years old, 12 years old. I was put in the care of child and family services within our province of Manitoba here and I uh, was shipped out from my First Nations community to uh, Winnipeg where um, a perpetrator was grooming me at a Greyhound bus stop. As you can see our similarities are very um, very similar in nature and um, I had my first hit of crack cocaine at 12 years old. I um, was exploited at 12 years old um, onwards um, in the visual um, sex industry here in Manitoba and then was trafficked throughout um, the, the province and then I was trafficked to BC, Ontario, um, Toronto, uh, uh, Alberta. So I was trafficked through borders uh, which are provinces with, within Manitoba or within Canada. 
Um, and it happened for years, um, whether it was through street-based um, street exploitation and or online. For myself, um, you know, I don't want to focus too much on that piece, but also acknowledging um, the fact that people are still being um, being um, corralled around um, uh, as we as we have this webinar. I'd like to acknowledge those those voices, those people, um, our sisters. Um, but in about 20, 2004, I escaped my trafficker in uh, Duncan, not Duncan, in, uh, in BC. I, I escaped my trafficker through, through um, uh, an individual that was purchasing sex for me um, in, in, a place, in a place in BC. And um, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know why. I, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I escaped and came back to Manitoba only to go into the sex industry and in the visual sex industry um, but was determined after losing a friend in the sex industry um, and um, not knowing if I was going to be next, not knowing if I was going to be next to go missing or found murdered. Um, I was determined to try and shift my life around and try and make something of it um, but during that time um, our voices were pretty silent, and service providers were were uh, making decisions on our behalf without our consent, and um, I didn't like that. No matter if I was still um, still entrenched in in uh, the industry, I um, actually pulled up a chair. I pulled up a chair um, in at a meeting in front of fifty executive directors that were that were delivering services to those whom whom. Um, whom are exploited and or trafficked. And I was determined to sit the, at that table, but was, was um, I don't know, I, I felt very little because I didn't hold any academia behind my name compared to them. But I was so determined and I promised myself never to run out those doors. And I sat there and built bridges and relationships with them. And um, we formed a coalition, which is the Sexual Ex Exploited Youth Community Coalition here in Manitoba in response to young Indigenous women in the province of uh, Manitoba whom were found, um, who were exploited and trafficked and were found murdered on our outskirts of our city. So uh, the service providers come together each month and have been coming together each month for a number amount of years. Um, and through the duration um, of that, we've uh, created a trust under a young Indigenous woman's name, which is Trisha Owens. Uh, there's a trust in, in the province of Manitoba that pumps $10 million annually each year in delivering services to exploited youth. Um, so that's some of the work that I've been doing and um, one of the things uh, sitting there, I, um, it, it was hard to get service providers to acknowledge the fact that we survivors exist. Um, it was hard for, the, for, for service providers to employ um, survivors. Um, I think um, it was a challenge overall, but Overall, um, throughout the years, we've we've been at those at those decision-making tables, making those decisions. And in the province of Manitoba, here they cannot push an um, a uh, initiative without the voices of those with lived experience. I think that's one of the key and critical pieces um, moving forward on any initiative internationally um, when when it comes to exploited and human traffic. Um, human traffic um, individuals. So with that work in 2010, I shared my, my story for the very first time. It was liberating. Um, I felt liberated and I felt heard. Um, and it was to 200, 350 people. Um, and I can hear a pin drop and that's when I actually was heard. And through the duration of sharing my story for the very first time, I was approached um, from service providers to build a safe house for um, human traffic youth. So uh, we built that safe house within two years, sitting with an architect with 18 survivors here in the province of Manitoba uh, in an undisclosed location. We, uh, built, we built a longhouse 
uh, it's, it's a beautiful home. It's called Hands of Mother Earth. It's featured on uh, some projects within the States, which is um, CNN's uh, Freedom Project. So if you want to look at that, it's featured in there. So um, it's, it, it's been a struggle throughout the years trying to get um, service, service providers uh, to, to listen and to approach us and to include us. Throughout the years, um, we've um, been in in Canada. Um, it, we are leaders in Canada, the province of Manitoba, when it comes to exploitation, and human trafficking. So, one of the things we have done in building partnership um, with with those those service providers, we build partnerships with the whole ch hotel chains of uh, Manitoba, um, and the CFL. Um, like a whole bunch of service providers of the Winnipeg Police. And um, we now when we have sporting events coming within our province that uh, we team up, we team up and we, we start the, the conversation prior and what we're gonna be championing. And uh, we've championed buying sex as in a sport within our province and went all out um, and went all out with our campaign and delivered it twice uh, when we hosted our Grey Cup here. So uh, some of the work that I have been doing uh, with all that work and combined, I was um, appointed to um, an Indigenous advisory for our police station here, which is uh, the Winnipeg Police. Uh, so that's some of the work that I've been doing. We, uh, we've been appointed, um, I've been appointed also um, to an Indigenous advisory, currently an Indigenous advisory to the Office of the Federal Ed Budsman, uh, and Budsman, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something um, that's just current. Um, so I don't know. I I I'm really honored to to sit with um, my amazing sisters from the states because we can learn from each other. I think that's important. Um, I also, I, I've, um, with the work that we've been doing collectively here in the province of Manitoba and that I've been very vocal and instrumental on, I was um, given um, the Human Rights Commitment Award a couple years back and will be receiving another award next year. Um, so um, I, I look at those pieces and, and honor those pieces and in a way, um, in a way, um, to to change the voices of those with lived experience and include them in the conversation moving forward. I've also um, I, I do a lot of work. I don't want to take a lot of time, but I'll leave it off at that um, and hand it off to Roxanne. Putiaya, Ignash Unuksha, Roxanne White, Washnash Kanik, Yakma Ku Nimipu, Ku Nuxat Ku Anani Grovant, White Clay People, Mukshaisha Duwamish Territory, Seattle, Washington. Um, my name is Roxanne White, and I am Yakima, Nespers, Nooksack, and Anani, um, the white clay people. And I presently reside and occupy um, a small space here in Seattle, Washington. And um, I just learned how to do that uh, not too long ago. And, and I was thinking I, I need to learn more. Um, I feel really touched right now. I've been trying to stay in prayer and listen to my sisters and send them prayers as they're sharing and opening up. And I'm thinking how beautiful all of them look and how proud I am of all of us. And I need to look at everybody's face. For some reason it was queuing in on me and I don't really just want to look at me. But um, I just feel so, so happy and so grateful that um, I get to be a part of this. And 
Carrie is not on here right now, but um, when we were getting ready to start this, uh, Carrie was expressing herself and, and I also want to express myself in the same way as to, um, I come from a, a generation and an era where um, we just didn't talk about what happened. We didn't talk about what happened at home. We didn't talk about uh, what what our family was, was going through or they experienced. I didn't, you know, but even though we didn't do all that, like I talked, I, I, I probably like all my life, I've been a talker and, and then I sit here and as I was listening to my sisters, I was thinking as much as I talked, every person that ever uh, abused me, exploited me or raped me, they're free. Not one person was ever tried or convicted or arrested. Um, and, and I mean, that's everybody. And, um, you know, I, I, I want everybody to know, like, if you're listening to this, like, like this is a big day for us. Um, many of us were very nervous. I'm very nervous. I'm always very nervous to speak, but I, I am inspired and I'm empowered and encouraged by these, these women, each and every one of them. And, and I'm in awe because it, it feels, it feels so good to be 47 going on 48, still to be here and to have uh, five years, nine months and one day clean and sober. That's a part of my story. And I wouldn't be sitting here if I wasn't clean. I want to say that, you know, in everything that happened to me in my lifetime is not something that I go around and I tell everybody, you know, I was raped, I was kidnapped, I was abducted from my home, I was molested by this family member, I was I was trafficked by that family member. I don't go and say all these things, but when I do, I'm not saying them because I'm boasting or I'm trying to make it about me. And and yet I have to battle the voice of, of telling me to not say anything because, you know, what I have to say isn't that important. And so I think, you know, there's, there's, I can resonate. It resonates with me, what everybody here has been saying. And, and even though I am dark complected and I got blackish starting, well, that the black is hair dye, but, but this, this stuff right here, you know, coming out, even though I resemble a Native American, I wasn't just raised with my language. I wasn't raised with like all this stuff, you know. I was, I, from my earliest memories, I remember alcohol, fear, in, insecurities, not knowing like what's gonna happen and never knowing where I'm gonna be next or, or what's gonna happen, where am I gonna stay? Where's my mom going to be? Where's my dad going to be? I mean, is my sister going to be safe as my cousins? You know, I, I, that's the world I was, I was brought up in. And, you know, we've, uh, several of us have used the word groomed and I feel like my entire life was a grooming for abuse, for domestic violence, for trafficking, for drugs and alcohol. Um, for depression, I mean, all this stuff, the historical and the intergenerational trauma, you know, for me to come to the place that I am in, and when I when I said those things earlier, I wasn't just trying to rush by them, but I too, you know, it, my journey started at the age of four. You know, I, I don't know how to, like, I'm also getting therapy. I'm also getting, you know, I've been getting therapy for years. And, and ceremony is something that I utilize in my life, but, but there are times and there are moments that it just baffles me and, 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 and buckles, like I just curl up because when I think, when it comes to me, did that really happen? Were you really abducted from your home at the tiny little age of four years old and assaulted and raped? by more than two men? Were you really missing that night? Because nobody in my life really ever confirmed that except for my cousins and my dad. You know, I had one conversation with him before he 
he passed, you know, and, and since then I've had other conversations with other relatives because in, in coming out to do this work, to using my voice, I had to also go to family, my sons. Um, when my dad was alive, I went to him. My brother was alive, I went to him. And, and, and I let people know in my family that, and I did it just like that. I let them know, like I wasn't asking for permission, but not today. I am going to be sharing my truth. And it is not meant to hurt anybody in my family, but it's still a conflicted feeling that I, I remember the responsibility that I have as an auntie, as a grandma, um, as a matriarch in my family. Uh, uh, not, I'm not the oldest, but I'm, I'm up there, you know, in my family. And um, especially with my brother just passing. So I say all these things to say that, you know, in, in that time and in that era, as I've come, I've had to go back and look at my history, go back and look at my grandmas and my grandpas. And, and that's been part of my healing. And I want to, I want to say how empowering this moment is to be able to talk about all these things. And like, we're going to have so many other conversations, but the thing that I'm here to say is that as I've been on this walk, on this Chancaluta, this red road, what I have seen inside of the human trafficking, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, the movement, is I haven't seen me. And I don't just mean me by Roxanne White, my face, but I mean me, my story. You know, being trafficked on the reservation or in the city, because I've been, I've been both places, to be trafficked in a, in a farm workers camp on the Yakima Indian Reservation, or to be familial trafficked, or, or just to have, I mean, 20 years is what I survived. That's my story. It's, it's long and it's wide, and, and I'm still uncovering and discovering so much about my life. Um, so, so it's like, it's, it's layers, it's layers and layers. And um, today, you know, as we we're getting ready to do this, I thought, what was the thing that I wanted to share the most with other survivors is, and, and, and also um, any, any organizations that might be watching is I totally agree. Uh, please stop tokenizing us and stop speaking for us. You know, I have a voice. I have a very strong voice. I come from very strong medicine people, a long line, thousands of generations. Trust me when I say that, that I can speak for myself. And trust me when I say that, like, like my true heart is to uplift and to bring out this, this darkness in our communities to the rest of the world because I have nieces, nephews, great grandchildren, that in the generations to come that if we don't start really noticing or start calling out things as they are in our communities because because forced fraud and coercion looks different in different places there are different styles of man camps there are cargo ships there are all these other ways there is don't try to fit us into this bracket that says there's my alarm that says that we are just one person or that we look like this it was hard for me to believe that i was a trafficking victim because uh the mainstream uh human trafficking wants to make it look like everybody's like 120 pounds soaking wet you know and young um even when i was 20 i wasn't 120 pounds soaking wet you know what i mean so i just want to say that that i am that face um and that I, I belong here and, and I'm owning this today. So thank you so much, Anita. Thank you everybody on here. Um, thank you to everybody that showed up. I love each and every one of you. Oh. And I'd like to turn it over. Geez, how do you introduce her? Um, Anita is very humble about her situation and, and the work that she's done but I am honored to, to present and to say Anita Lucchese, 
my sister, my friend. Uh, thank you for bringing us all here together and for truly, truly being a sister that amplifies the voices of indigenous survivors of human trafficking. We are so much more. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne, and um, thank you to all the sisters who have shared. Um, I know we're approaching our, our five o'clock window. We're, we're definitely going to go past that, but if anyone needs to leave, we understand we're recording it, and the recording is going to be available um, on Sovereign Bodies Institute's website later this evening, which is sovereign-bodies.org. Um, so if you need to dip out and you want to hear later, um, it'll be available. Um, I'm going to share just a little bit about um, uh, not necessarily my story a as a survivor, but more um, about why I created the council and um, and why why this kind of space is so important to me. Um, and I, those people who know me know that I'm I'm really not a crier. I don't. Um, it's something I actively work on because my trafficker used to um, hit me for every tear that came out. So I learned to just not cry. And um, I, it's something, sometimes I really have to like will myself to cry like, come on, man, this is sad, just cry it out. And, I, and sometimes I still can't cry. So to, like, for me to cry like publicly on a webinar is a really big deal. Um, but I just am so inspired by all of the women on the council and all of their amazing stories and their beautiful hearts. And um, you know, I, as a survivor, getting to meet a lot of these ladies individually um, I saw the beauty and the power in, in their hearts and their spirits and their stories. And I wanted to create a, a platform for other people to see that too. Um, and that's really at the core of what the council is and what it means to me. Um, I feel very fortunate that like so many of the women on the council, um, Rachel and I have gotten tattoos together. Roxanne and I have been in ceremony together. Sutton and I have like camped and when it got too cold we came to the office and slept on sleeping bags on the floor <laughs> we've all been through some crazy adventures together but um it getting to experience that sisterhood individually made me realize that we really needed a more formal space to share that sisterhood um you know with the world and, and with other survivors and um i really uh you know a, a big reason why I wanted to start the council is because as a survivor who's been public about my story, um, my story I feel like has been exploited quite a bit um, by the press um, and by the movement. And um, you know, even just last December, I, uh, I testified as a survivor of trafficking against the Keystone XL pipeline and media picked up the story and um, they referred to me as the girl who got her toenails ripped out because that was one of the things in my testimony that I said my trafficker did to me. And um, it just so happened that like the second season of that R. Kelly show came out around the same time and I was watching it and there was something one of his victims said that just really resonated with me. And she said, you know, look, after the first season came out, I wasn't me anymore. I was the girl that R. Kelly raped. And for me, I felt like I wasn't me anymore. I was the girl who had her toenails ripped out. And that was part of years of journalists and other people in the movement um, really engaging in some really toxic behavior and um, monetizing my story for their own um, benefit, whether it was shock value for a news story or um, trying to, you know, weaponize it in a way that um, just didn't feel good. You know, for example, I've had um, you know, people ask me for police report numbers and um, I've had people ask me, well, how, how many times have you been raped? How many times have you been sold? Um, and those kinds of questions are obviously so offensive and hurtful. Um, but I, I've literally had people tell me, well, you can't possibly be a survivor because uh, there's no police report. And my response to that was um, police solicited me. Who was I supposed to report to? Um, the, the same police that were trying to buy me? Um, or was it the police who came to the house with guns and almost killed us? Um, because that was my experience with law enforcement. And um, I did reach out to service providers. I reached out to native service providers um, at that time and, and nobody helped me. And um, I was very, very alone. And it was my family that got me out. Um, I'm really thankful to them for that. And, um, you know, for the rest of my life, I'll owe my little sister a debt. She was 
young. She was um, barely in high school. And uh, when she came all the way to Washington to help me escape um, and uh, never judged me, never asked questions, uh, just showed up to help. Um, but I think, you know, the reason why I was crying listening to all of my sisters on the council share their stories and um, and their thoughts about what it means to be a survivor leader. Um, even though I've overcome all of all of that and, and started SBI and um, I'm in a, a fully funded PhD program and um, I, I've done, you know, all sorts of amazing things. Um, I still haven't left that fully behind me. Um, it's the summer is coming up on the five year anniversary of my escape. And um, to this day, my trafficker still um, harasses me on social media, kind of the way Sutton was describing. Um, you know, they'll make new profiles and new emails and um, it's just kind of relentless. And um, because I never reported, um, because I didn't trust police and because, um, because I was afraid of his family, um, I now, five years later, don't feel like I have a whole lot of ground to stand on in getting protection from him now, um, or even getting support from service providers or figuring out what's next. Nobody really knows what to tell me. Um, and so even to this day, I still struggle in figuring out how do I keep myself safe? And when it, I came to that realization in, um, last year, um, it, it really, um, what, what struck me the most is just how many people rely on SBI, whether it's the families we serve, the survivors we work with, all of the people that learn from our resources and, and the things that we do. And um, if something happened to me, who would keep SBI afloat? Um, who would keep the spirit of what we're doing alive? And, um, you know, that's something that still weighs heavy on my heart. But for the first time, you know, today, listening to, to all my sisters and, you know, Sutton and I were up to like 1 a.m. last night talking about this. Um, I feel like, you know, hopefully nothing will happen to me and I'm making every effort to make sure that that doesn't happen. But um, if it did, whether, you know, by um, by that trafficker or, you know, who knows, um, in my line of work, I feel like is you know, kind of dangerous. We work on cases with murder cases that aren't solved and t tackle racist, rapist police officers and, you know, the whole nine yards. But um, if something did happen to me for whatever reason, um, I know the ladies on this council would keep the spirit of what we're doing alive. Um, and that even if I was gone, that the work would continue um, and that um, it would be in really good hands. So that's what the council means to me. Um, and I hope that for folks who are listening, whether you're a survivor or a service provider or just a community member that wants to learn more, um, this is why spaces like that matter so much um, is because we fight so hard to create them for ourselves um, as survivors and, um, and they're, they're life-saving, they're life-changing and um, they're they're absolutely essential to the safety of our communities and the well-being of our communities. Um, so uh, we don't have to be the only one. I would love it if there were 50 survivors councils. Um, and uh, Roxanne and I have dreamed about what that would look like. Um, and so I, you know, I, I really hope that today the takeaway is that survivors are um, incredibly powerful and knowledgeable and resilient and strong and courageous and um, have so much expertise to give um, and so much leadership to give, not just to this movement, but to our communities as a whole um, in, in all sorts of ways. So um, with that, I'm gonna um, end my portion and um, open it up to Q&A and I gotta, I'm blind without my glasses. So I gotta put these back on. Um, I know we already got um, a question um, we have two questions here from Karen. Um, the first is, um, in transitioning from a victim to a survivor, did any of you consider reaching out to a sex trafficking program for help? And if not, do you mind explaining why? Do any of my sisters want to take that? I would like to, I will, I can answer that kind of quickly. So I exited the life in 2000 and, um, 14 and about 2000 and 
16, um, 2015, I, I, I left from the area that I, I am from and relocated here to Seattle. And about 2017, I found myself um, uh, needing resources and I had come in contact with another survivor who had told me to contact this program here in Seattle. So I did try to uh, reach out to um, an organization that was directed towards uh, human trafficking and survivors. And I didn't get, well, I had one lady who answered and, and this is something that I like to share is that um, from the person that answered the phone, um, and this was an, supposed to be native led organization, the person that answered the phone um, was rude to me and didn't know how to direct me. Um, I, they, I never did get connected to anybody. Nobody ever called me back, emails were sent. So in that, like for me, that was very um, disheartening and it was hurtful, but I did, I did find a non-indigenous um, uh, led organization here in Seattle by the name of OPS. Um, OPS uh, um, is a prostitution survivors uh, organization and I happen to know some of the women there now. But when I was first here, I, I needed something for, I just felt like I was in a world where nobody knew like what I was going through. And, um, and so anyways, I did get services through them and um, I got like, like trauma yoga, support groups and things like that. But, but as far as indigenous led stuff, I have not been able to receive that uh, even to this point here in Seattle. And that's just in my area. I hope that kind of helps. Thank you. Um, I can say that for myself, I didn't reach out because I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't, I didn't identify with it because I didn't know the education behind it. I also blamed myself and I also thought that nobody would believe me. And I worked at a rape crisis center where they did sex trafficking as well. Um, they, they helped survivors get out. I saw that there was no housing, um, being completely addicted and strung out to, on opiates. I knew I was gonna need a detox. They did not take women and children who were, um, well, women who were under the influence um, especially one that was an op detoxing from opiates just because it's an, it's a nightmare to come out of. They did not offer shelters with uh, detox to where your children can come with you. Um, there was nobody who looked like me. There were very many um, non-indigenous women, especially women that didn't look like me, who really wanted to understand, I hope, but asked me a bunch of questions that were just crazy. And, um, and it was really hard to open up just because they absolutely didn't understand anything, you know, from the complex trauma to the intergenerational trauma to my addiction how that led from one thing to the other, especially the choice that I wanted to use drugs. That, be, that choice was not mine. And um, that's why. Did I answer the second part? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I didn't seek any services. Just because I was afraid, um, I was ashamed, and I was really kind of unaware even that I was, that I was trafficked. Um, and it wasn't until I started doing my independent studies and until I started reading Anita's and um, Sarah Deer's research um, that I really came out as a survivor. And I didn't come out publicly as a survivor 
um, until just this last January at a public uh, news conference. So no, I didn't seek any services. And in my area, there are some pretty good services. As far as I know, there's there's a lot of, of good services, um, but uh, that's another focus of of my my specific research with McNair is that cultural aspect that a lot of these agencies lack. And I think that the problem with a lot of indigenous survivors is that they only feel comfortable with with cultural um, aspects of healing and and um, culturally based treatment centers, if you will. At least I would. I mean, that's what I would have felt comfortable with if I would have went to something like that. Hello. There's another question right there. Oh, you're going to answer that? Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I'm going to answer the question to the transition from a victim to a survivor. So one of the things I didn't even know in the work that I was doing, so prior to before that I had, um, there was minimal services, minimal services um, pertaining to um, exiting and or helping survivors of sex, tra sex trafficking in, in the province of Manitoba when I when I had exited, one of the things where I was sent to was Salvation Army. And Salvation Army um, didn't, didn't fit well within my spirit. Uh, one of the things when I first got there, my first day at Salvation Army, is they threw a Bible in front of me. And um, I didn't even know um, my culture as an Indigenous person, but these people are yet trying to force the Bible on me. And one, one of the things was I walked out the door and um, had exited that facility um, only to go um, to the street and be victimized over and over. So throughout the duration of the time, um, I didn't know the work that I was doing um, after that. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I didn't know. I, I was like, people were saying, oh, she's a survivor. She's a survivor leader. You know, she's championing this. And I was like, I... I honestly didn't know what that meant or the work that I was doing um, illustrated that for a number amount of years. Um, so I think for myself, I really, you know, really needed to draw through within myself. Um, and eventually I'm like, hey, I'm like, I guess I am a survivor leader, you know, to be quite honest, to answer that question. I also want to acknowledge the people on the chat Piece. We haven't acknowledged them. There's a lot of chat going on there. So I'll leave it off at that. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully that answered your question, Karen. Um, I'll touch in and answer that question also. Um, when I was 18, 19, living on the reservation in Wyoming, um, first off, I don't think there's any sort of trafficking services. What DV services that we do have on Wind River Res in Wyoming is very limited. Um, you know, um, and Mainly because of the type of climate we live in in Wyoming. In Wyoming, there's still um, a lot of um, stereotypes and hypocrisy that comes with survivors of DVSA and trafficking. So the type of climate that we live in is that you should be ashamed. If you are a survivor, you should be ashamed. You should be, uh, you should hide from yourself. And um, if you do come out about that, you should just know that that's your fault. You chose to drink. You chose to drink. You chose to put yourself in that situation. You're choosing to live that party life or to use. So you deserve that to happen to you. That's the type of climate that we live in in Wyoming. So even if there was those types of services available, which there isn't, there's no trafficking types of services available for Arapaho women right now on the Wind River Res. And we do have something called, ooh, I forgot what it's called, the Red... So what DV services that have been uh, available to Arapaho women on the Wind River Reservation is very spotty. Maybe we'll get a grant and some, some strong Arapaho women will take a hold of that program and you know advocates will be out there. Um, but then maybe something will happen and they kind of, we kind of fall off and then there's no services available. The only advocates that maybe Arapaho women have access to are non-native advocates on the border town of our reservations. So why, you know, and then there comes those uh, issues, right? I don't feel comfortable as a Arapaho woman having 
telling my problems to a white lady in Riverton. It's just like, it's not going to happen, right? I don't, it's not, I'm not going to go put myself out there like that just to deal with whatever microaggressions this white woman's going to come at me with. Um, but he, like I said, even if there was trafficking services available, um, that's the climate that we live in is so harsh towards uh, survivors in Wyoming that I personally wouldn't feel comfortable coming out. Um, the fact that I lived in Seattle the last six years and I work in the DVSA field for the last four years, I'm educated and confident enough in myself to know like I, I'm, I can articulate my story. I could now look back and say what happened to me and now advocate for myself in that context. I just now came out as a survivor of trafficking about two months ago. So now I'm just now uh, pursuing therapy, pursuing my outlets. And I'm thankful to have a very solid foundation of coworkers who are advocates. And I, I work in this field. So I have a huge toolbox of resources available at my fingertips right now. So I'm thankful uh, to be put in that position. But I think about all the other survivors out there on the res out in Wyoming that don't have the that don't have the access to um, tell their story, to advocate for themselves, let alone even have a program or services available to them. Um, so I hope with you know me telling my story, me being so adamant um, about where this happened to me, why it happened to me, that other Rapo girls, other Rapo women will be able to be like, you know what, you know I don't get, I don't need to be ashamed of this no more. I don't I don't need to um live in that and i can get out the game if i want to you know what i mean i don't have to do this no more um and i saw the last part of that question was like what do i think would grab people's attention what i've noticed in the work that i do is that just those non-conventional ways of being in your community i do i go to high schools because people have like you know block parties or high schools have like people speakers come in you know, I'm out and I'm out and doing a lot of community organizing around MMIW, no dapple, you know, all the I'm out in the streets with Roxanne, you know, uh, all these different urban native community events. And, you know, what it's it is empowering when you see other native women telling their story, okay, you know, if this native woman could do it, I could do it. And that's the reason why I told my story because I saw Roxanne doing it. I saw Anita out here, you know, telling her story on Facebook. I'm like, I'm not alone. And that was the biggest thing for 12, the last 12 years of my life is that I felt alone. There was other, I didn't see any other native woman talking about this. You know what I mean? And seeing other native people doing it, other native women empowered me to tell my story. So thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought up the second half of that question. What I wanted to do is we actually have a couple questions left and I think they're all around um, similar um, or kind of a shared perspective of on the one hand wondering um, how do we get more survivors involved or help them feel more welcome to access services or support? Um, what would be effective for survivors? Uh, and then on the other hand, um, how do we uplift survivors in the movement and what can survivors do uh, to take on more leadership um, uh, to address this issue? Um, and I do want to acknowledge too that part of that question is from Melanie and specific to Idaho and um, Roxanne um, being from Idaho is going to uh, address that piece as well. Does anyone want to start? Hello. Now, Anita? Sure. Okay. So, hi, um, Melanie, and Melanie's question is, Wopi Latonka, thank you for sharing your stories. I am Hunkpapa Lakota. I'm a survivor and a PhD at Boise State University. Um, I see that you're working on um, to undertake the statewide study of MMIW in Idaho. All organizations want data of MMIW, and I know it's a complicated issue. Um, my, my highest priority is exploitation of their stories um i just wanted to say to you that first of all like this is this is like exactly why we're here so i just want to say melanie i i appreciate you as a sister you as a survivor of i don't I, i'm not going to assume to know what you have survived from but um speaking on mmiw and just touching on you know, research and stuff like that. Part of why we're here today is because um, it is a continuous, something that 
me as a survivor and me also as an MMIW family. So I am from uh, um, Kamii. I have um, my, both my maternal and paternal grandmothers um, uh, generations back are from uh, Nez Perce Nimi, Nimi territory, Chief Joseph Band. So um, what I'd like to say is that in, in everybody that does this research, I think it's so important and we, we don't have this and, and how do we say it? I mean, this is the thing. How do we say something in a very polite way that um, while doing research, Anita is a great example of research, of doing research and collecting data. She is our first indigenous um, uh, researcher of MMIW, of co uh, uh, collecting MMIW data. And how did she do that? How did she gain respect from so many families? because Anita respects the families. And Anita works with the families. He has uh, 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 done everything she can to, to fight for the families and to respect their voices. And I think that's a major thing. When people think that, and, I, and I'm responding to your part about you wanna protect survivors. You wanna protect survivor stories. Um, I think that's kind of like, I'd like to echo on what I said earlier is that I don't need protecting. I mean, and, and I want to say that in a good way, and I hope that I'm not misunderstanding what you said, but but also like, like if I'm telling my story, I want to tell it. But also, in, if you're if we're talking about MMIW families, I want to say that this is a very fine line because right now, so many people are exploiting MMIW G2 families. They are they are not respecting families, going to families and allowing families asking for permission, um, asking families, uh, even just letting families be the voice for their own loved one. Um, I was doing, uh, I've been over there doing work with families long before legislation even became a thing over in um, Idaho, because that's where my people are from. That's who I am. That's my ancestry. So I think that in, in all the work that you do, I hope that you consider that and, and consider grassroots because grassroots as far as like even going back to Canada is led by families. It's led by survivors. It's survivor and family led. So so I think like, uh, thank you, Jessica. Jessica touched on that. Working with families and, and honoring and respecting their voices is where it's at. Um, I, hope that, I hope that that made sense to you. And I thank you for uh, coming on. And if you wanna contact or, or have further conversation, I'm sure that I need our sovereign body institute to connect us. Thank you. What's Yayo? Thank you. Can I add in on that conversation? Um, I think um, if you're trying to protect survivors, I don't think you should be protecting them. You should be supporting them. You know, supporting them prior, before, and after, after uh, speaking engagements and or for them sharing their story, and and supporting them and asking them what it is their support system looks like, or uh, and breaking that support system down to to value the, their their needs. Um, I think that's the important piece. Also, too, as a family member directly affected to the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit people in Canada, and someone that um, that's been that's been ch championing this issue since 2004, 2005, when I lost my best friend, um, then became a family member directly affected to the issue, and I currently work in government with an amazing advocate that's been championing the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, in in Canada. Um, I think um, first but foremost, you need to, everybody that speaks on that issue really needs to meet the families where they're at, not where they want them at. That's the important piece. Um, and one of the things is walking uh, alongside them, not in front of them and not behind them, but holding their hands through the duration and the process of of um, uh, of of this open wound that will be open for years to come, years to come uh, as a family member directly affected, but prior before that an advocate, I, it really hurt my heart to become that family member um, that um, lost a loved one to a brutal act of violence here within Canada and the justice system failing my family um, in a 
in a brutal way, my cousin was decapitated in my home community. Um, and the, the perpetrators that, that murdered her got one year. Um, so that's why I continuously um, am my cousin's voice when it comes to the issue. But not only my cousin's voice, but include, include um, and collectively um, wrap my arms and my love around each and one of the families here within Canada. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, uh, Alea. And I also wanted to, to say my condolences to you, but also that if I didn't clarify it before, I am coming from a personal place. These pins and, and all these red silhouettes you see here, um, a lot of the work that I have been doing prior to this, a, a lot of people were just calling me an advocate, an activist. And, and I'm like, no, I'm a family. I, I This is my cousin, um, the woman on that, photo back there is my aunt who was uh, shot point blank in the face in front of me um, in 1996. Um, this is my cousin who was missing for almost 300 days and we did a vigilant search for her. Um, and and uh, in almost 300, 300 days um, on July 4th of 2019, she was found in uh, a freezer that was um, dumped on an unofficial dumping site on the Yakima Indian Reservation. So, uh, and since then, um, also my niece, uh, my brother-in-law and my sister, uh, her husband, his daughter, um, Eviana Cortez was uh, shot and murdered in a drive-by gang shooting where there has been no uh, follow-ups or any kind of anything in the case. But like, like with my aunt, um, there, was, there was really no justice. She never got a trial. They, when it's native on native violence, they allow people to get away with these things with a slap on the hand and practically nothing. Um, do the bare minimal, justice has not stood up and has not protected us in all kinds of ways. So when, it, it's a very personal topic to me when people start talking about MMIW and what they wanna do for MMIW, I totally agree. I've had too many people uh, profit, exploit, uh, want to speak for it. It's a hot topic. It's it's going to get you noticed or whatever it is, your five minutes of fame. And I'm not speaking to you, sister, but I'm just saying as in general. So I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to, to, to even touch on that. Thank you. I think also to leading with that conversation, I think also to um, the individuals, a PhD student is also going into within your university or college and and building those partnerships and relationships with, with criminology specialists, um, you know, people, people that are going to be working in the field and start building those bridges and start challenging each other to do better and work better. Also, too, um, I just want to touch base to one of the things is building a partnership and a coalition of some sort and form with, with Indigenous tribes within, within the communities, within the states, and building, uh, building that national, but then moving international. So one of the things we have done prior was um, we had the FBI. Um, so I shared my story with, with all of them in um, border crossing, a border crossing within Canada and the US a few years back. So one of the things the conversation was there. The conversation is there. The seed was planted. Um, and I think uh, it, it was up to them um, within the states in Canada and the U.S. consulate to, to water that seed and, and watch it grow. So uh, I've yet to um, see that. And I'd like to have more conversation on a different note with that with you. So, yeah. Thank you, Elena. Yeah. Thank you, sisters. Um, I want to be conscious of time because I know that we've been here for two hours now. Um, but it's been a really good discussion. And I do want to get back to the kind of like two core questions that we had that we haven't had a chance to answer yet. Um, one of them being how do service providers better support and serve survivors um, and, and better do outreach to them. We also have someone email us a question about um, how do non-Indigenous um, folks who are providing services um, do this in a good way. Um, and then the kind of other side of that coin is, is how do we empower more survivors to take on leadership in the movement and get involved? Did we answer Lauren Smalls Rodriguez question yet? Um, I'm, I'm kind of looping it into that other first question, which is how do oh. service providers better 
or more effectively um, provide services or she mentions healing processes for trauma. Um, basically, how do we better support survivors as service providers? So as service providers, if you are working with indigenous people, I would recommend that you have access to cultural healing. Um, because a lot of us um, don't have that access. When you're going through something and you're coming up with all this stuff, if you don't have transportation, one, then that's a, that's a barrier. So removing those barriers but also having community that is able to either a pour water, attend ceremonies, gather medicines with you, come and pray with you, teach you how to pray, um, sweat lodges, all of these things that for some of us are the answer to the healing, it's the ticket, it's the way out. Um, because I believe that we all need hope and we all definitely find something um, to hold on to, and, and maybe that hope is a power greater than ourselves. And with that, we are able to find a spiritual path. Um, and you know, a spiritual path isn't necessarily talking about God or religion. For some people, they can use love as something that they can hold on to, that they can really resonate with, that they're using that as a focus to hope that they can get to a healthy, loving relationship with themselves or with anybody else. But I would say for service providers here in Sacramento, that is not, and I'm talking about the county level and even at the state level, um, CPS, they do not have access to tribal services. They do not collaborate with tribal organizations. And many of those tribal organizations in and the surrounding areas do have people, spiritual leaders, who can come and pray with these um, survivors. Also, meeting survivors where they're at, because if a survivor doesn't wanna do all this stuff, all of these things that are on their case plan that somebody professional is wanting them to get, it's just not gonna happen. So meeting people where they're at, even with their language, um, and I say that because, you know, for myself, I, I cussed a lot. <laughs> and so when somebody was themselves and more down to earth, um, it, it made me more comfortable. It made me kind of take, you know, like I could sit back a little bit easier. I could breathe a little bit better. Um, at the, one of the places that I work, we, hit, we did beating circles. Um, we did, you know, a making of uh, drum making, learning songs, that type of stuff that goes a long way it goes way um deeper and more successful that i've seen as a service provider and for myself um with indigenous people because it's something that resonates with them that they don't even know is there thank you rachel um jessica i know you wanted to speak to this a bit too I'm not crying right now. A bug just flew into my eye. <laughs> the bugs in Nats in Minnesota right now are starting to come out and it's really annoying. Um, yeah, the question um, of how does your um, organization and leadership council work with non-Indigenous allies? If so, what ways uh, non-Indigenous allies work with you and can support you? And then as a preventative measure of learning, are there examples that you could share about actions that non-Indigenous allies unintentionally or intentionally enact that undermine your leadership? Um, and I would like to speak to this specifically because I had a bias incident um, that happened um, just at the beginning of this semester um, in, a, in an online course that had to deal with um, working with Native American families. And uh, I had somebody tell me, because I introduced myself in the class, um, I have been really open with, with everybody um, at my university and at all my classes about um, my traumas and what I'm studying and why I'm studying the things that I am. 
Um, so I had a woman tell me that she can hear her privilege while saying this and that I shouldn't immerse myself um, in MMIW or my trauma in academia. And that alone was like a complete smack in the face, um, especially in a class that's supposed to be aimed at working with Native American families. So to answer that question, how you can be um, an ally and not uh, whatever the terminology is, um, I would just suggest on um, really doing research on multi-generational and historical trauma, because even if somebody it doesn't isn't open about their traumas. Um, indigenous people have suffered from trauma hundreds and hundreds of years that date back to colonialism. So it affects all indigenous people in different ways. And it's important that when you're working with Native American people, just to assume that they do have those traumas and to act, you know, accordingly and don't use your privilege to try to discredit their trauma in any way. Um, and that was something in that class that really, really opened my eyes about, about the biases that are, that are in social work and law enforcement and everything, all the biases that are, whether implicit or implicit or not, um, she, you know, specifically said multiple times that I can hear my privilege while saying this. Um, so definitely avoid that <laughs> at all costs. <laughs> but I'm actually doing a presentation on that, like I think tomorrow or Friday or whatever. I don't even know what day it is. This quarantine's like I um, don't even know what day it is. But yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that because she. Thank you, Jessica. That's all um, I got for that one. <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I want to wrap a bug in my eye. Oh. <laughs> um, I want to wrap it up, but before we do, I, I do want to speak to our survivor sister who asked the question of um, how she can get more involved. And um, Luna, I know you mentioned in the chat that um, you're currently in Tijuana and um, that you're in Mexica and Puta Picha. And um, I just want to say that SBI from the very beginning has always worked across colonial borders. Um, so you've seen in this council, we have um, women who are from both US and Canada. Um, and we, um, we also have, um, SBI has a project in Peru. We have a sister collective in Mexico. Um, our, our belief has always been that if you're indigenous and um, you're a survivor of violence or have been impacted by violence, there's a place for you, um, regardless of what country you're born into, because ultimately they're all colonial occupations anyways. Um, so, uh, to any survivors who may still be on the call, um, Luna included, um, please do reach out to us. Um, the council is not set in stone. There's always um, more ways to get involved. We're always looking for um, more sisterhood to build. So, um, for any survivors who are interested in that, please do reach out to us. Um, the best way to get in touch is to email me. I'll put my email um, in the chat, but um, it's also, um, let's see, how do I, okay. Um, all panelists and attendees. Um, it's Anita with two N's at sovereign-bodies.org. Um, so if you want to get involved, please let me know. Also, I know this webinar was really heavy. Um, and if you're a survivor, or even if you're not a survivor, it could be um, kind of intense or triggering. Um, so I do want to let you know that on Thursdays, SBI hosts virtual support groups. Um, we have one for survivors and one for MMIP family members. So um, if you're interested in joining either one of those groups, please reach out to me and let me know and um, I'll get you the login information. Um, we don't wanna just you know, throw you out to the wind and after listening to all of the, all of the heavy stuff um, and not have a place to come talk more. So please do reach out to us. Um, and again, the, this recording will be available on our website later this evening. Um, so with that, I think I'm gonna close it out.
thank you so much for, um, you know, to all of our attendees who have been so supportive and um, asked some really great questions. And we look forward to continuing this work with all of you. Naish, thank you. Katsuyo, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. We see you later.